How wonderful it is that we are celebrating Dad's Day here at MDPC. It's a wonderful observance, and, well, I'm a preacher, but I'm also a dad and a granddad. So I'm glad to celebrate today, and besides that, I have my own favorite team. What this church won't inspire me to do. <laughs> Whoo! <clears throat> I'm about to read verses from the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. This is the Word of God. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. May God bless to us the reading and the hearing of this portion of His holy word. Pray with me, please. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Jesus was on the road. Ah, but then Jesus was always on the road. The Bible tells us that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. And so Jesus was always on the road. Only this time the road was a bit different. This time the road led up to the north, up to the land of the Gentiles, up to the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon up to the country we know today as Lebanon. As far as we know, this is the only time in his adult life when Jesus traveled beyond the bounds of the land of his birth. I suppose we could say that the journey to the north was for the purpose of engaging in a time of spiritual retreat. You see, Jesus knew that his earthly ministry would soon come to an end. And while it was true that large crowds eagerly gathered to see him or hear him whenever he made a public appearance, the fact of the matter is great opposition had arisen to him and that opposition had become organized and entrenched. And consequently, Jesus was dogged every single day both by those who loved him and sought his help and those who hated him and sought to be rid of him. It was, to say the very least, a pressure cooker existence. And so Jesus longed for a brief respite from the pressure. And thus, he set out toward the north, up to the land of the Gentiles, where he knew the Jewish people would not dare to follow now, we do not know how long this time of spiritual retreat lasted. 
most scholars say perhaps a couple of weeks or so, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is that it was a time of calm before the storm. It was a time when Jesus could garrison his own spirit and Jesus could prepare his own disciples for the stresses and strains he knew were soon to come. And yet amazingly enough, even there in a land not his own, even there Jesus was sought. And thus he had an encounter with a woman who came to him seeking healing for her daughter. Now, we know precious little about this woman. We do not know her name. We do not know her age. We do not know whether she was rich or poor, attractive or homely, shy or gregarious. We do know that she was a Canaanite, that is, she was a Gentile. We know that more than likely she was married. I mean, we at least know that she had a daughter. But apart from these few sketchy details, we actually know something infinitely more important about this woman. We know that Jesus summed up her whole character and her whole life by paying her the highest compliment he ever paid anyone. He said to her, woman, you have great faith. Now, I want to tell you, that is a very weak, poor, pale translation of what Jesus actually said. No, when you accurately translate what he said, it comes out sounding like this. Woman, my, oh my, oh my, what a magnificent faith you have. It was the highest compliment he ever paid anyone. Never paid anyone else that kind of compliment, not even his own disciples. In fact, more frequently, he chided them for their lack of faith. And yet to this woman, he says, what a magnificent faith you have. Now, on the strength of the compliment Jesus paid this woman, I want to suggest to you that the Canaanite woman can teach us a hefty, heady lesson on the subject of faith. For we learn first of all from her that faith is turning to the person of Jesus. This woman had a daughter. The daughter was ill, seriously ill, mentally and emotionally ill. And apparently this woman had heard about Jesus and his supernatural power. And she believed that Jesus could help her. And furthermore, she believed that she would do anything she had to do in order to get to him. And she had to do a lot. You see, she had to overcome the barrier of hatred and prejudice. And frankly, there is no stouter barrier in the human experience than that. Understand, please, this woman was a Canaanite Jesus was a Jew. The hatred between the Canaanites and the Jews was every bit as intense then as the hatred between the Arabs and the Israelis now. You do remember, don't you, the story of Joshua in the Old Testament? How Joshua led the people of Israel in to occupy the promised land? Well, the people who were displaced in that occupation were the Canaanites. And so there was born at that point in time a hatred between the Canaanites and the Jews that burned white hot right up to the time of Jesus. And so this woman had to scale the barrier of hatred and prejudice in order to get to Jesus. She believed that Jesus could help her and she would do anything to get to him. Now, I would like to suggest to you that that is an apt definition of faith. Faith is believing that Jesus Christ can make all the difference in your life and then being willing to go to any length in order to get to him. Faith is turning to the person of Jesus. 
Faith is making Jesus Christ the constant, consistent, consuming, controlling center of your life. Faith is having such a deep, profound, personal relationship with Jesus Christ that your every living, breathing moment is lived in continual reference to Him. Faith is turning to the person of Jesus. Let me kindly suggest that if you have never made the decision to make Jesus Christ the central focus of your life, well, then you haven't... Uh, <clears throat> How do I express this? Let me try this. Boris Pasternak's novel, Dr. Zhivago, has in it a character named Galitsyn. He's a young man. He's arrested by the Bolsheviks, charged with political insurrection, sentenced to death, placed before a firing squad. And in that moment, he cries out, Comrades, don't kill me. I apologize for anything I've said or done. I will do anything you're asked. Just don't kill me. I haven't really lived yet. There it is, that last phrase. I haven't really lived yet. If you have never made a deep down personal commitment to Jesus Christ, if you've never offered to Him the very best that you are and the very best that you have, if you've never made Jesus Christ the constant, consistent, consuming, controlling center of your life, then let me suggest to you, you haven't really lived yet. Because I promise you, on the strength of my own journey in the faith, there is no life on this earth which can begin to compare with a life lived in daily obedience to the one we call Savior and Lord. Faith, yes, faith is turning to the person of Jesus. And we learn also from this woman that faith is staying in the presence of Jesus. This woman came to Jesus seeking help for her daughter. And the Bible says, Jesus did not answer a word. Holy smoke. Whoa! Oh, talk about discouraging. She comes to Jesus and Jesus doesn't answer a word. Talk about discouraging. But this woman wouldn't be discouraged. She kept staying after Jesus. So much so that the disciples actually tried to chase her away. Talk about discouraging. But she wouldn't be discouraged. She had come to Jesus Christ and she had come to stay. She reminds us that faith requires staying power. We need to be persistent and persevering in our faith. We need to keep on believing no matter what. I saw that so clearly in the last years of my dad's life. My mother suffered from Alzheimer's disease. The final chapter of her life, she lived with all of her mental capacities completely shredded. She returned to a kind of infant state where she could no longer care for any of her needs. My dad would have to feed her every bite, just like my mother used to feed me every bite when I was an infant. My dad sat by her bedside day after day after day, year after year. She couldn't speak. She couldn't communicate. She couldn't say what hurt. She couldn't say, I love you. All she could do was cry. And my dad sat there day after day after day, watching the woman he loved for 50 years gradually disintegrate right before his very eyes. At one point, I said to him, Dad, how do you keep doing this? Don't you think you ought to just give it up? He wheeled around on me and with the fire of faith that always burned in his eyes, he said, son, 
I love your mother. And I have faith. I don't understand it. But I still believe. I've never since forgotten that. I never will. And that's why I can tell you, no matter what happens to me in my life, I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on believing in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is nothing less than God in human form come to this earth to live with us, to die for us, and to claim us as his own. I believe that and I'll keep on believing it. I believe that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, the only begotten Son of Almighty God. I believe that and I'll keep on believing it. I believe that this book is nothing less than the Word of God written. It is the only inerrant, infallible rule for everything we are to say and think and do and believe in life. I believe that and I'll keep on believing that. I believe that there is salvation in no one else but Jesus Christ, that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, save the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that, and I'll keep on believing it. I believe that one Friday they hung him up to die, and then they hauled him down from the cross, and they buried him tight. And I believe that on Sunday, God reached down from heaven and cracked that grave wide open and lifted his only son to new life. And I believe that Jesus Christ walked out of that grave alive forevermore with all the power of heaven and earth in his hands. I believe that and I'll keep on believing it. And furthermore, every other belief that I hold in my life is based on that one great shining belief. I believe it and I'll keep on believing it. And therefore, my friends, I plead with you, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what good or ill may come your way, keep on believing. Keep on believing in Jesus Christ. Faith requires staying power. We learn from the Canaanite woman. That faith is turning to the person of Jesus, yes. And faith is also staying in the presence of Jesus. And then one thing more. We learn from her that faith is claiming the promise of Jesus. There's an absolutely incredible exchange that takes place here between this woman and Jesus. It's very complicated. And it doesn't even appear in the English versions. And so you're going to have to hang on tight with me here for just a moment. But, but I want you to see this. I want you to see it so clearly. It's absolutely amazing. This woman came to Jesus pleading for his help. And what does Jesus say? He says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yikes. That sounds like an insult. I, I mean, come on. She came to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? It's an insult. Or at least that's what it sounds like. In its original form, it was an insult. But it was not an insult the way Jesus said it. This is what you have to see. Let me explain to you. You remember what I said. There was this hatred between the Canaanites and the Jews. So much so that the Jews actually referred to the Canaanites as dogs. It was, a, it was an insult. It was a racial epithet. But you see, the word they used for dogs was the word for street dogs, cur dogs, mangy dogs, ugly dogs. But Jesus took that saying, and by changing one word, he softened it in what he said to the woman. He changed the word for street dogs to the word for house pets, cute little puppy dogs. Jesus was saying to her, listen, here I have come to the people of Israel, the children of God, and I'm offering them the bread of life, and they're in the process of rejecting me. And yet here are you, a woman whom they would call a dog, and you are reaching out to me in faith. It's absolutely amazing. 
But it doesn't end there. I love what happens next. This Canaanite woman must have been so sharp because she immediately caught the wit and the wisdom of Jesus. And she came right back at him. She said, yes, Lord. But even the cute little puppy dogs get the crumbs that are swept from the master's table. She was saying, Lord, I know. I know that I'm someone whom the Jews would call a dog. I know I'm not worthy or deserving of anything from your hand. But Lord, I also know that way down deep in that great, big, gracious, loving heart of yours, there are just a few little crumbs of grace down in there left over. And I'd like for you to take those little crumbs of grace and just sweep them off into my life. You see, she was claiming the promise of God's grace in Jesus Christ, even though she knew she wasn't worthy or deserving. I want to tell you something. I believe that this was one of the happiest moments in Jesus' earthly life. I believe that when this woman said what she said, that Jesus split the heavens with a burst of joyous laughter. I believe he threw his hands in the air and he cried out, Thank God for this shining moment. Woman, my, oh my, oh my, what a magnificent faith you have. Your request is granted. Your daughter is healed. Faith is claiming the promise of Jesus even if we don't deserve it. <laughs> Not long ago, I saw a bumper sticker. The bumper sticker read, God loves you whether you like it or not. <laughs> oh, that's so true. God loves us whether we like it or not whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we're worthy or deserving of it or not. God loves us. And when we understand that, when we understand that God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for us, when we understand that God loves us like that, then that begins to change everything. It changes the way we live. And it changes the way we love. And that's why I'm calling you to turn to the person of Jesus, to stay in the presence of Jesus, and to claim the promise of Jesus. You see, I want you to remember that no matter what happens in life, no matter what hurts or hazards or hardships, no matter what trials or troubles or tragedies may come our way, I want you to remember you can never be ultimately beaten in life unless you give up. You can never be ultimately defeated in life unless you let go of God. And so, my beloved people, keep on believing. Keep on believing in Jesus Christ. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when, no matter why, no matter how. Keep on believing in Jesus Christ. Keep on believing. Keep on. Keep on. Keep on. Believing. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen and amen.